Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I wanted to let you know about a new free ebook available on our website. This ebook goes over the top reasons most financial plans fail and covers what a quality financial plan should consist of. The link to download Top Reasons Most Financial Plans Fail is listed in the episode notes. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to a Wise Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom. Today is my co-host, Brad Lyons. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. And we're also joined by Jordan uh, Sudi Norton. Uh, Jordan has, has been on the podcast here many times, but she's a uh, CPA at Sudi CPAs. Uh, where we're talking about strategies for high net worth tax planning, along with some other, uh, I guess, more current event items. I will note that this is a podcast generated by humans, not by AI. And we are real people. <laughs> yet. That's good news. No AI yet. <laughs> uh, I keep following this chat GPT stuff. Um, I will, I think a few episodes ago, I talked about they had like 2 million users. I was really, I was wrong on that. We had a, uh, regular listener call me out on that. And uh, actually, it's over 100 million. I was going to say, it's probably a lot more than yeah, that. Yeah, it's over 100. It was like 2 million like the first hour or something like that when you can sign up. But um, ChatGPT also got hacked. And I was at the tail end of this, so I didn't actually get to participate. <laughs> but supposedly, uh, ChatGPT has a alter ego called Dan. And then Dan doesn't have any filter. So Dan will say crazy stuff. Stuff that we probably shouldn't be saying. But also talk about the biases of chat GBT and the biases in AI, you know, in general, I mean, not chat GBT talking about that, but just biases in general. But anyway, I digress. It was a very, a very, um, interesting, um, uh, car ride. We had a, my daughter and I went out to a horse show this last weekend. And, uh, one of the podcasts I was listening to was talking about chat GPT, Dan, <laughs> I was like, what? I totally missed this whole thing. Um, I had to up my, uh, my blog game. I had to add a couple of blogs to my daily reading so I could stay on top of the top of the news. But um, I think we just passed the, well, we did just pass the one year mark for the war in Ukraine, which is, um, I don't know. Very, it, it's, I think neither side reports like their actual number of losses, but we estimate what a hundred thousand Ukrainians have lost their lives over two to 300,000, somewhere in there. Russians have lost their lives. Um, Wall Street Journal had a great article last week talking about um, just that war. It was multiple pages. But, um, you know, I I think we've all been surprised by Russia and their lack of attack on the battlefield. You know, just... And surprised by the resilience of the Ukrainians. Well, everybody was surprised by that. It was like the third day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really sad, and I think it's starting to become very politicized now. Um, obviously, you know, we have Biden talking about supporting Ukrainians no matter what, and now you're starting to get some people to dissent against that and basically, hey, we got, you know, this is, this is war. it doesn't end well. Uh, and now you kind of look back and you wonder, man, what, what could have been done to even prevent it to begin with? Uh, were, were we faming, fanning the flames that we shouldn't have been doing? Um regardless that we're here now. And, you know, I, I was, I was just a child in the early eighties, but you know, you, you think about the cold war and all the things that built up to that and how we as a nation and uh, with help of other nations as well, we were able to create this, this peace, right? And are we just undoing all that at this point? You've got China potentially selling weapons or willing to sell weapons to Russia. That can't be good, right? Uh, Of course, at the same time, China was on CNBC this morning talking about welcoming the West back to uh, China to produce goods for the world. (laughs) That's not going to happen if you're selling weapons to Russia. (laughs) I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) But but we... we, um, you know, when it comes to financial planning, I think that the war, you know, I don't know that really affect, affects us much in financial planning, but for asset management, it sure does, because it's, I think it's wreaking havoc on 
inflation and and so many other things that that we're um, that we're you know that end up in portfolios. Well, it has factored into inflation and the supply chain without a doubt, and those factor into our investment selections and the performance of the portfolios. So. Yes, in a roundabout way, it, it has. Uh, in a more direct way, it has through energy prices as well, which we all pay for at the pump. So it has had an effect, um, but hopefully it's short term relative to the length of time that we do planning for. Remember, planning we're doing planning out to age 95 for a retiree, and we're hoping that uh, the relative difference between the time that this war yeah. continues and the planning sequence that, that we utilize is 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 much diminished hopefully yeah yeah the, the, ultimately russia needs to feel like they won and ukraine needs to feel like that they're safe and so it um it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this gets this gets played out um i'm not looking forward to 2024 the election cycle in 24 that's going to be brutal um i think we're going to have to do several Several podcasts on politics does not affect how we invest money <laughs> as indexers. Anyway, yes. as individual stock pickers, that could be, that could be very different. But I, I think ultimately, um, you know, when, when you look at uh, the world right now and, and, and it, what it does is it creates fear. Um, and so when people get fearful, they, they do silly things. Um you know, I had a conversation, long conversation with the client last night about um, annuities. He's like, oh, man, you know, this the war in Ukraine and there could be, you know, Russia, Russia could use the nuclear weapons. And, and for some reason, that equated to them as buy an annuity. <laughs> it's like, well, it's safe. And I was like, well, if there's nuclear war, <laughs> the insurance company's not going to be paying anything. Uh, that's not, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, we still have to focus, focus long-term. Well, th this period of time that we're in and that we're talking about it has created a lot of uncertainty for some people, right? Okay. They can't look past it. They're, they're, they're stuck in it, so to speak. And when they say things like, I want to buy an annuity, what they're really saying is I want to create certainty in my life. I want to have some certainty. And you know, if that's, you know, what they're looking towards, it's unfortunate because it's a false sense of certainty for them because the, the annuity in this instance creates a lot of uncertainty long term. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is the, the, the problem, but they're sold in such a way that it, it sounds like it's, it's creating certainty, but the only certainty that it's creating is for the annuity salesperson. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, he said the, the person that he had talked to, which is a friend of his, which it always is, right? Um, I don't think anybody ever goes looking for an annuity. They typically get sold. They're not bought. Um, but he says, yeah, they cir circled all the negative numbers in my portfolio for the last month and said this would never happen in an annuity. And it's like, yeah, we well, can also circle all the positive numbers too. <laughs> that will never happen in an annuity. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're, um, we've never been really pro, uh, annuities. There are fixed annuities that act like big CDs and that, that's a little different. Um, but these indexed annuities that are so popular now, um, the, the one that, the one that, um, uh, I saw recently was offering 40%. So basically you put your money in now, they give you 40%. So you get a 40% overnight rate of return. Right, then you get nothing else for uh, ten years. So basically, it's four percent per year. They're just giving it to you all at once, and th and I think they know they have to do that because if the U.S. Treasury is paying five, why the heck would you lock your money up for fourteen years? Right, right. Um, and then, and then there's a cap, so you can't make more than I think it was six percent per year. So you're guaranteed you're guaranteed this four, but then the expense ratio is like around three percent per year. So you're given that forty that you're going to erode that by three percent per year for the fourteen years. Can't make more than six percent. So in the end, how much how much are you really making? Not much. No, unfortunately, a lot. And that's why I say it creates more uncertainty in the long term. Yeah. Because if you were to surrender that or you were to annuitize that, you would not get that forty percent. No, they would. 
you would surrender that right. portion essentially. Correct. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you, it's money you just throw away for, yeah. for that long time period. Um, okay. Well, Jordan, you want to talk about them? Yeah. What a good segue into <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> high net worth tax planning. <laughs> right. Well, those, they're terrible to inherit. Right. We see that quite a bit. People inherit annuities and they get taxed as regular income. They don't, they don't get a step up in, in basis or anything. So it's, yeah. It's, it's a bad situation. We had a client last year who um, had a K-1 coming from an estate, and they told us, hey, expect this much money. We had no idea it was an annuity. So when we did the extension payment, we got it all wrong. You know, it, it came in, we came in way low. And so, yeah, it's a terrible, terrible tax. Yeah. It's situation. really bad for legacy planning, which yeah. we, we talk about a lot here. Um, okay. So we have a high net worth. Uh, this is the high net worth podcast. We have a high net worth individual, uh, probably large amount of income from multiple sources and man, we're paying a lot in tax. So we're going to talk about 10 ways you can, um, reduce your tax bill. So let's start with, uh, number one, this is, uh, back in Brad's court here. Uh, Mr. Mr. Investment, uh, Captain Brad, actually. I thought about that for the podcast. I'm going to start introducing you as Captain Brad. because well, it's Cap- boat- Captain Cashflow. It, it's it <laughs> Captain <laughs> Cashflow. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's almost boating season, right? That's so, right. So almost. Captain almost. Brad uh, can guide us uh, through this first one. Manage your investments being tax-wise. Uh, municipal bonds, tax loss harvesting. That's right. So I have a question about muni- municipal bonds. Okay. So if I if I invest in municipal bonds, mm-hmm. what tax strategy? Why why is that such a good tax strategy? Well, uh, securities, fixed income securities issued by the government, either the federal government through the U.S. Treasury or municipal bonds through state and uh, local municipalities, are taxed preferentially. In, when, when you file your income taxes. So for example, um, municipal bonds are federally st- uh, tax-free, federal tax-free. And if you file in the state that the bond was issued, there may be state tax-free benefits as well. On the other hand, treasury securities are state tax-free. So they're taxed preferentially as well. And it's done for a couple of reasons. It's done to keep the cost of our government's borrowing low Okay, so you're incenting the, 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 the investor to take accept a lower interest rate in return for their uh, loaning the money. And, and two, on a municipal level, many of these municipal bonds are, are offered uh, with a guarantee, guaranteed uh, repayment, which is not available in the corporate world. Right. The, in the federal world, in the treasury world, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So in the municipal world, you're getting both a guarantee and a federal income tax uh, exemption. And the way to determine that is literally you determine what the yield is when you purchase the bond, and you divide that out by one minus your marginal tax bracket. So the higher the marginal tax bracket, the greater the tax benefit to the bond. And what you're doing then is you're trying to equate a tax-free bond to a taxable bond, right? Mm -hmm. Determine where you're getting the better benefit. Should I buy the taxable bond at a higher rate or should I buy this municipal bond at a lower rate knowing that I don't have to pay federal income taxes on it and perhaps even state if it's filing in the state that it's issued. Right. Okay, so that's called the tax-exempt yield. So if I... tax-equivalent yield, excuse me. If I'm in the, you know, 12 to 18 percent marginal tax bracket municipal bonds probably aren't doing much for me probably not but if you're in the 37 percent tax bracket it's doing a great deal for you you know so municipal bonds are a very good way to create a bond portfolio to create tax federal tax-free income to yourself you know for you know managing your marginal tax brackets right 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 and maybe this is, I, I want to make a point, maybe it's not important necessarily for high net worth tax planning, but something that I've seen recently is, you know, a lot of things hinge on your modified AGI. So you have all these calculations, Medicare premiums could, you know, hinge on that Roth or IRA contributions. 
And while the municipal bond income is not included in your AGI, it is included in your modified AGI. So something to think about when you're, you know, you have all this muni bond income, but it's also could keep you from doing other things at a tax advantage way as well. Yes, all tax strategies have to be considered in your investment portfolio right. mm-hmm. itself. So it's, it's, it's a part of the, the, the puzzle, if you will. Let's say that you, you work with your CPA and you create a tax strategy. The investment portfolio has a part of that, but there mm-hmm. are other um, entities or other avenues also involved in that. So right. it's, Absolutely. it's not the only way to manage your tax brackets, but it certainly needs to be coordinated with an overall tax strategy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's the difference between a, you know, financial advisor at a Wells or a Merrill or wherever versus a wealth manager, because your total rate of return is not found on your, on your, um, your brokerage statement. It's, it's a combination of brokerage and tax, right? You know, case in point, a long, long time ago, <laughs> Wiser Wealth Management, which was known as Wiser Financial Services at the time, we, we were a stock picking firm. I was not here, but we were a stock picking firm in the late '80s. And when I took over in '07, they had option strategies and they had um, picking individual stocks. I had little old ladies paying twenty thousand dollars a quarter in estimated taxes. When I took the tax return, and then I, and then I. I then adjusted the total rate of return. It was less than the S and P 500. Like you're better off just buying the S and P 500 ETF and skip all this, all this trading. Mm-hmm. And essentially that's what we did. We transformed wiser into uh, what it is today with using low cost ETFs. Um, but th- that's the difference in understanding the tax side and, and your investment side. Another one example would be tax loss harvesting, which we did a, a podcast on here a few episodes ago. Um, But understanding that even when you have down years, creating those capital losses going forward in your portfolio, because those those capital losses can then be credited toward other things, right? Mm -hmm. Gains in the portfolio, but also a sale of a business or absolutely right sale of real estate. Yeah, any capital asset with a capital gain. Correct. Yes. Yeah. The the tax loss harvesting can be a a tremendous benefit, and it's estimated over long periods of time it can add as much as three percent to your overall rate of return on an annualized basis over periods of time. And, and when I say 3%, that's when it's an incorporated with an entire strategy of year after year after year of utilizing tax loss harvesting to offset gains in, in other areas. So um, tax loss harvesting is, is a tremendous benefit. Uh, when, nobody likes to see the losses in their portfolio, but once they have occurred, you might as well take the benefit by harvesting them Okay, and utilizing to offset future taxable gains. Going back to muni bonds, is, is there a rule of thumb and when to deploy those, or is it really just more of a case by case basis? You know, it kind of has to be a case by case basis because it's all part of an overall strategy and an overall portfolio, okay, which may include other things like real estate, business income, passive income, earned income, and so on. So it's, it's, it should be, you know, looked at and you know, considered in a portfolio strategy based upon an overall plan that includes tax strategies, don't you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to number two. Um, Now, if you have a high income, this may not be the best strategy, but if you see high income coming in the future, you could consider converting your IRAs to Roths. And what does that do for us long term? So you're putting your pre-tax dollars into your IRA. If you can get it into a Roth, convert it into a Roth, you're going to pay tax on the conversion amount, and then that amount's going to grow tax-free from here into eternity. So um, definitely an awesome tax planning strategy, but you do have to watch out for if you're putting yourself into the next highest bracket. You know, if you're converting $500,000 and now you're in the 37% bracket when you could have waited until retirement, you would have been in the 12% bracket. I mean, it's it's a numbers game. It's a timing game. So it can be beneficial, but it can also hurt. So you've got to you got to time it correctly to make sure that it's doing you work for taxes. I mean, we last year we went through four hundred plus households, one at a time, to see are we missing any conversion opportunities, and a lot a very interesting um, notes kind of came out of all that process. We have clients who are all very wealthy, but 
they're in the low tax bracket. They're done working. Mm -hmm. They have, they live off a brokerage account. They have very low tax liabilities, right? So we forecast this all out into the future and go, man, you're in the 12% tax bracket right now. In 20 years, you're still be in the 12% tax bracket. So the question is, do you convert, you know, now because you're in the 12 or do you not convert? And we chose not to convert because why would you pay the tax now when it's going to be the same tax bill later? Right. Right. Yeah. Those lower tax brackets typically haven't changed over the decades. Right. And, it, you know, yeah. you see what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, cause you know, you're just, pay, you're, you're paying. Well, you're losing <laughs> the, the, the compounded interest on that 12% yeah. over yeah. the it's, next 10, 12 years. Correct. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like, do I want to pay my utility bill now or would I rather pay my utility bill <laughs> 20 years from now when it's due? I don't want to pay the utility bill 20 year that in 20 years now I want right. I would just pay it then. Right. Right. So, so that's something that came out of that. The other one, um, now the, the home run was when you're in the 12% bracket today, but when your RMD hits, when you're 75 mm -hmm. or 73, um, now you're in the 24% bracket. Right. That's a no brainer. Yeah, absolutely. Those first few years after retirement, those are when we really, you know, attack the Roth conversions when you're in that 12% bracket, you know, and you're not converting maybe the entire IRA. It's you can chip away. You, you well, you convert up until you right. stop yeah, at the 12. Exactly. Exactly. So you're chipping away at it and at least getting some of it moved over, Correct. Um, you know, is, is the beneficial piece there. And then if you go to the, if you convert up to like the 22 or 24% bracket, to me, that's you're rolling the dice now. Cause are you going to, in 10 years, are you going to have, are those brackets going to be higher or the same? I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. People say, oh, we spent so much money, we have to increase taxes. But we're not. Right. It's not happening. Right. So, I, you know, I don't, that, that's a tough one to make. You could be wrong right. in, that, in that conversion. Yeah. Now, if you have a low income year and you're in your 20s or 30s, to me, there's, there's enough time to make up for. Because anytime you pay the tax now, you're, it's kind of like you've lost 12% or you've lost 24%. How long will it take you to break, break even and then start gaining above the waterline again? So I, I think the game probably is defer, defer, defer as long as possible. Yeah. Um, ultimately. Right. But it is a, it is a calculation. It should be done. And, and you, you look at it from, you know, from different angles. We had, uh, we had a client come through, I did not work on this one. This was uh, uh, done by Missy Beach, our, our senior planner here. But she came to me and she showed me this huge spreadsheet. And she she was basically like, this person wants to, doesn't want to pay tax or doesn't want to pay RMDs in the future. And I said, well, they don't want to pay RMDs or they don't want to pay tax. Mm -hmm. Those are, I mean, our, the RMD tax, that, that's a tax too. But ultimately we came up with a break even that, if he lived to age 92, he'd save $60,000 by converting all his stuff to Roth now. Is he going to live to age 92? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, so a lot of this stuff comes from like ARP and the, all the articles they put in there to do a Roth conversion to save. And so the people read these articles and they, these articles are for the masses. They're not for specific right. situations. Absolutely. So, um, all right, number three, con contribute to five twenty nine plans. So, yeah, five twenty nine can for for people who are in the the high marginal tax brackets. Five twenty nine plans can be a great way to do a couple of things. One to save for college because if you kept that money in your name, you're paying the highest marginal tax bracket on the earnings that you're trying to utilize and accumulate to send right. someone to college with. But by putting it in a 529, you're, you know, um, what is it? It's tax-free earnings if withdrawals are qualified withdrawals for every college. So let's just say that. The other thing you're doing is you can help manage your estate tax later on. So grandparents can actually use the 529 if they're in a high tax bracket and lower their tax bracket, their earnings and on taxes on their earnings as well. So 529s can be a great way to do this. And later on, depending upon the circumstances now under the new laws, 529 balances that are left over after college, certain amounts can be rolled over to a Roth IRA for the beneficiary's name as well. Mm -hmm. So you're getting quite a few benefits there in a 529. Yeah. And if you, um, at least here in Georgia, if you contribute to a, a Georgia 529 plan, 
um, you can receive a state tax deduction of 8,000 per beneficiary. So that's you know, pretty nice. Yeah. And something I learned recently, I don't have kids yet, but I've considered what if we open a 529 plan for, you know, one day. I mean, the longer it sits there, the longer it earns, the greater it'll be. And you can do this even without having, you know, a child listed as a beneficiary and still receive the state tax deduction. So pretty cool. So now you, um, you don't use the Roth, you can convert or use the 529, you can convert to a Roth now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also two different ways to open it. You can open it as an account owner, an individual account. You can open up as a minor account. So on the FAFA form, it's better if it's in the kids, if it's in a minor account. But I don't tell people to do that. I still tell people to open, especially grandparents, open it up in your name. You control it. You have a account uh, backup owner, which can be the parent. Mm-hmm. Um, so it never technically leaves your estate if you're the account owner and you can still control things, right? But um, but yes, it, it grows tax-free. So yeah, there was something, um, I think my wife, it was my wife last night, she was talking about Matt Walsh and he had a whole article now about, um, you know, maybe we really shouldn't be going to college because it's just so expensive. And that's where all this wokeness is coming from. That's, you know, taking over the world. And um, I I just don't think that there's any world in which I would tell my kids don't go get a four-year degree. (laughs) I just, I just can't subscribe to that. I, you know? Yeah. So I I think that it can be used for um, technical school though. Um, It can be used for, for, um, even high school. Yeah, secondary. Right? Second, yeah. yeah. Pr- our primary. Pri- yeah. Primary education, right? Is that what they call high school? Primary Second, education? Secondary. <laughs> get confused. I, I thought secondary was college. I think that's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, All didn't these learn terms. That. I didn't learn that in college. Yeah, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, basically, uh, we could use it for elementary school. I don't know why you put money into a 529 and take, to pull it back out a couple years later. That right. doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, but yes, you, you can use it for a lot of different things and you can change beneficiaries to your children. So my son, thankfully, um, has a full ride. So we're, we're done. So his will get converted into, um, his sisters who <laughs> will cost me every penny <laughs> that I got. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, number four, max out your 401k. Um, this is something that you know, we're starting to catch as people are earning more income that they're still doing the 50% raw, 50% pre-tax. Yes. And I always tell them, say, look, you know, you're, you're, you have a high net worth, you're making good income. You have to think about this differently. And so therefore everything goes in pre-tax because you're saving 37 plus percent on your, on your dollar, right. That's going in. And then you save additionally into a brokerage account. And hopefully when you get to retirement, you have this brokerage account you can live off of for, for almost no tax liability whatsoever, right? If Brad's done his tax loss harvesting, uh, we have all these credits that have built, built up over these years. Uh, and you, you spending down that money and then it gives you an opportunity to convert IRA to Roth at 12% until you have to do RMDs at 75. Because by taking it 75, that, that, those conversions can go longer now. That's a huge ad. Huge uh, opportunity yep. if you structure your buckets right. Yep. Um, so you want to be saving pre-tax. Um, you can also do the mega backdoor Roth option, which we've talked about that in a prior podcast with you, Jordan. Yeah. Do you like, remember? Do you remember the tricks to that? Because not everyone has the option. The <laughs> the mega backdoor. The mega backdoor. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a neat it's a neat tool. I mean, everyone you think that you're limited to the twenty thousand five hundred. Or whatever it 22 is, twenty two five. Yeah, twenty two yeah. five. I'm thinking backwards on you know, twenty two <laughs> tax returns right we now. We all do. Um, but you think you're limited to that, and you are in a in a way, you know, pre tax deductions. But then you can keep contributing to over and past that, tw- you know, twenty two five. If, if your four hundred one k has this provision, if they do, yes, I know that Delta, a big employer here in yes. Atlanta, allows for that, and so we see it a lot with Delta pilots. Correct. Um, you contribute past that and you know now you have these after tax dollars sitting in your pre tax four hundred one K and you have the ability to then roll that amount directly into a Roth. So it's a, a yep. great tool. And uh we have we have uh hundreds of 
airline people here as clients. Right. So, uh, but yeah, they, they can do that automatically now. It used to be you had to make a phone call every month, and now um, Schwab and Fidelity will do that automatically awesome. for you. This Megan backdoor Ross. Um, but yeah, j- typically large companies offer those. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish I could have it in the Wiser Wealth Management 401k plan. We 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 were told no, too small. <laughs> so if you're at a small or medium company, you may have may not have that option. Yeah. But if you're a business owner, uh, perhaps um, you designed your own 401k plan. You can certainly um, you can certainly do that. Um, something that I think people forget about this is number is five on our list um, is maxing out the HSA. So. What, what we tell people, and you probably do this as well, is max out your HSA, your health savings account. Now, this is different from your flexible spending account. Flexible spending accounts expire. Right. You got to pull the money out, use it or lose it. Right. But HSAs are kind of like health savings accounts by the name, and you can invest it, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but don't you ever spend it. Right. So put the what's the family max this year? Do you Does anybody remember? 300, I think, but that's a couple years ago. So I think it might be up to 78. Okay. 50, so we, we can put like $7,800 a year into an HSA. It grows tax free and it's deducted now. It's kind of like a Roth for healthcare. Right. And then when you get to retirement, you can use that money to then fund your healthcare expenses. Yep. Absolutely. And then just pay out of pocket for your, your healthcare expenses. Right. 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 Yeah. Hey, People come to us all the time and they're on a W-2 and they're like, what can I do to lower my taxes? And although it is you know, what we consider, I guess, low-hanging fruit, I mean, maxing out the HSA and maxing out the 401k is your first step into really saving taxes currently. But then you can take these vehicles and really make them work for you in the long run. Uh, so about real estate. So, you know, during the financial crisis, we had a lot of uh, what I call accidental landlords or unintentional landlords. <laughs> where your house was underwater and you're like, ah, oh, you know, because you had enough cash to buy the next house. So you kept your old house, you rented it out. And those have all now come back above water. Um, but yet people still seem to have rentals here and there, or you have a vacation rental, something like that. Um, if, if you're selling that and you're going to buy another property, you should do a 1031 exchange. Absolutely. You, you're basically going to take your capital gains and pass it, transfer it into the new, um, into the new entity. And if you do it right, there shouldn't be any tax owed. If you do it right, it's a big, a, a <laughs> that's big a big key. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had a couple of people come to us say, "I want to do ten thirty one exchange," and they've already closed right. on the property. And there's nothing you can do at that point. They've gotten the cash. Yeah, it's you, too late. You need yeah. to plan ahead for ten thirty ones. Right. right. Um, but just real estate investment in general. So, in real estate you buy a property, you rent it out, you have all those expenses related to it. You're deducting your expenses off the income. So you can create almost a tax free income stream, Mm -hmm. but you're depreciating it. You're doing all these other things. There's a a point which all the tax comes due. Yes. So if you were to sell it and not roll it into a 1031, you know, maybe your income is equal to your expenses for all these years. Um, mm-hmm. on paper, you know, cash flow, but yes, at the same time, you've been creating this huge tax loss that you probably have not been able to take, or maybe you have. Um, but then when the tax comes due, all the depreciation, it just flips back into gain because right. you know, that was a deduction that you were given when actually your property was appreciating. So, mm-hmm. um, it can be a nasty tax bill if you're not ready for it, if you're not planning for it. Um, and that's why the 1031 is, is so beneficial. We have a whole podcast on 1031 exchanges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, go re- go reference that because yep. it, it, it can get a little complicated. Absolutely. Um, increase your giving. Now, there's been some changes on that over the years in the tax law. So right now, what if if, if we're, if we're going to give? It's not dollar for dollar. It's not a below the line deduction. It's not. It's an itemized deduction. Well, unless you are giving from your IRA, and we can talk about that, and, uh, in which it can be an above the line point. deduction. Um, but generally, no, it's an itemized deduction. So to the extent if you're married, all of your itemized deductions exceed 25-ish thousand, yeah. um, then yes, it will matter for you. Um, but if you're beneath that, then yes, you're still doing good, but it's not really helping you for a tax perspective. And then there are some limits um, when it comes to AGI. So if for cash contributions, you're limited to 60% of your AGI for cash contributions and then uh, capital gain properties. If you're contributing stock to a donor advised fund or directly to a charity of your choice, you're limited to 30% AGI. 
Okay. And and you're limited, you, which they're not disallowing. You get to carry that forward when you do have the, the AGI, but it'll be limited in the current year. So that, well, that goes into the next two things. Right, <laughs> so right, I'll, right. I'll save that question. But let, let's go back to your comment about um, – Give it, gifting out of your IRA. This is something we do or recommend to most of our clients uh, mm-hmm. when they hit their required minimum distri- distribution age. Right. I know a lot of your clients, they've paid off their houses. You know, they're living there, no mortgage interest. Their state taxes are low. You know, you've already reached the age where your property taxes have come down too. So for you to itemize, you'd have to be giving, you know, $27,000, $30,000. Um, but maybe they still want to give 10000 you know, and to their church or whatever charity of their choice. We can still make that work for them from a tax perspective if we d- direct their IRA to contribute that money directly to the charity of their choice, and then it it comes right off the IRA deduction. So if your your RMD is you know fifty k, we knock ten k right off of it, and now you're only taxed on forty k. That's that's truly a dollar for dollar dollar deduction. for dollar. Yeah, absolutely. So you, if you if you have required minimum distributions, if you're of that age, mm-hmm. you should be gifting out of your IRA, yep. not your not your checking account. And there's no minimum. I mean, if you want to give a thousand bucks, you, you can yep. do that, direct it from your IRA and it's a direct deduction. Yeah. That typically I say there's a minimum. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Just from a paper per, paperwork yeah. standpoint. Cause yeah. you know, Hey, I want to give $25 to this charity. Okay. From my IRA. Yeah. That creates a paperwork nightmare. So you, you want to, you want to kind of do it, say, Hey, I give to my church. And so I'm going to give my annual amount now. Yes. And people are kind of funny about that. It's like, well, I have to call the church, let them know that I'm going to do my <laughs> annual, that, that my monthly is not going to be there because they're going to think I stopped paying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so It's funny. You have to convince people sometimes, yeah, to do it. Like, this will save you so much money. Yes, so. it, it's it's the peer side of it that I think is harder for, right. for them to, to get grasp over the tax side of it. Yep. Um, so another thing is giving items of value. So explain that. This is like the Goodwill drop-off. Except. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, you can take your like kind items to Goodwill and um, that's kind of a hard deduction to quantify because yeah. I mean, Goodwill has a, a prescribed um, dollar value, but people usually just say, hey, I gave $300 worth of stuff to Goodwill. But you do have the ability to donate items of value, you know, things that you have. I mean, we've had clients gift expensive bottles of liquor or gold coins, you know, things that they have that they charity for auctions. Yeah, exactly. And they're able to receive, you have to have it appraised and you have to have the amount that you, that the value, the item is worth, but it is a great option. If you have things, maybe they don't hold hold any sentimental value to you might as well, you know, contribute it and get the tax deduction now for it. Um, maybe, you know, in this category too, could we not put like stock gifting? Mm Mm-hmm. So maybe it's not a deduction, but you're donating, you're not donating, you're transferring a highly valued stock yes. to a child, for example, right? So it's a gift, but you don't have to pay the capital gains tax. Right. Not, if you're, not, I'm saying adult child, not minor child. You're not going to receive the cash There's contribution. There's no deduction. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Yes. There's no deduction, but you're able to transfer assets. Yes. The only downside there is that if you're gifting it to a child, they're going to have carryover basis. Right. Same cost basis. Correct. Yeah. Same cost basis. Right. Whereas if you pass away and then gift it, it's stepped up. So well, let's talk a little bit about gifting to a charity then. Yeah. Highly mm-hmm. appreciated stock to a charity. You paid you paid a, a certain basis, mm-hmm. right? Your cost, if it is appreciated to up, you get the deduction on the current market value, yes. but you only paid what you paid, you know, as your cost basis. Right. So it's, it can be a tax advantage way to give, yep. to give appreciated and stock and get and the, the charity gets to sell it and they don't pay tax. Don't yep. pay t- you're avoiding right. the capital gains. You're getting the tax deduction and then your charity's getting the appreciated mm-hmm. value. Yeah. And, and yeah. I know that this is listed on here too, the donor advice fund. I mean, that's, we're really big proponents of that um, for high net worth clients. That's our next point. How did you know uh, that? I don't know. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Uh, yes. Donor advice funds. So let's explain that for a minute. They're awesome. They're, they're great tools. And this kind of gets back to the, Oh, I don't want to, I give monthly, you know, you gotta, gotta get out of that mindset. Um, instead of giving monthly or instead of giving, you know, every year, Hey, this is our last high income year. Let's contribute this stock that we have that we don't need. That's appreciated. And let's contribute it to a donor advised fund. So we're not giving it necessarily to the charity quite yet, but maybe we put a hundred thousand dollars into that donor advised fund. We receive a tax deduction for a hundred thousand dollars, and then we can gift that out 
10 K a year over the next 10 years to maintain our level of giving, but we're receiving the tax deduction in the highest tax bracket. Yep. It's awesome. And then, you know, I have, I've, I have no families that have given, I've created a donor advised fund. You can name anything you want mm-hmm. to, which is kind of fun. And then at Christmas time, the kids, uh, part of the kids job is determining, well, the parents say, okay, we, Based on the earnings, because it can be invested just like mm-hmm. a brokerage account. Based on the earnings this year, we're going to donate X amount of dollars. And so the kid's job is to figure out which charities they want to um, donate to. And typically, I think the families require them to, to to volunteer, you know, maybe 10 hours in a year to that charity. And then they they choose that charity and say, hey, hey I'd like to give you know, $2,000, $5,000, whatever it is, to that charity. That's so awesome. it, it's a neat It's a neat process. Yes. Um, that's part of that legacy planning and family and being right. charitable, thinking of others. Right. Um, all right. Well, we got through that pretty quick. Uh, last point really is just to build a team of advisors, um, CPA planner attorney. Um, we do that well here. We work closely with Jordan and Michael and, and, uh, Sudi CPA. We also, um, have a couple of attorneys in town, Sean Sheldon over at Morgan Johnson steel, um, Megan Flores over at Gregory Doyle that are great estate planning attorneys that have um, a whole team behind them. And so ultimately our role as advisors is to be the quarterback and to make sure that everyone's moving in the right, the right direction. Uh, so it's not just about portfolio management I was trying to explain that to somebody recently. And it's like, if you only focus on asset management, it's like the tail trying to wag the dog. Right. And so if you build your plan uh, out, your tax planning, your estate planning, um, there's, then there's insurance planning, all these other things that go along with it. But a full comprehensive financial plan will include a team of people that now have a strategy, give you a strategy, a blueprint, right. how to move forward. Yeah. And that's how we, that's how we operate here. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. The other day, my husband and I were talking, what if we won the Mega Millions? Like, if we won $100 million after tax, what would we do? And I was like, I would call a wealth advisor first. I mean, that's my first call. He was like, call Michael. I was like, no, I'm not calling Michael Sudi. I'm calling a wealth advisor, <laughs> right. and then I'll talk to Michael. Like, he, you're you, right may, you may call him to say, I'm not going to be in on yeah. tomorrow morning. Or yeah, any morning know. after that, yeah. <laughs> but, no, I, I'd call a wealth advisor because they really are the quarterback. I mean, they can – they you guys, I feel like, have such a well-rounded knowledge of all the moving pieces, and you need somebody that, that has that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. Well, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about our firm, Wiser Wealth Management, or want to schedule a consultation to meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, you can do so by going to the wiserinvestor.com. We've got schedule here all over the website. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, You can also click in the uh, the episode notes to schedule a meeting with us. Uh, We've got two episodes you might be interested in. Uh, Episode 127, The Cost of Inheriting Wealth. Uh, state tax and opportunities uh, to avoid it. And what is tax loss harvesting? I think that's uh, a good one after coming out of uh, 2022. You probably could still have some losses in there that could be, that could be uh, work to your tax advantage. Just episode 81. Don't forget we have a wiser retirement on YouTube as well. Uh, does inheritance count as income was one that uh, we do. Our topics on uh, the YouTube channel actually come from people's searches. So what, what are, what's the world searching for? And then Hadley uh, sends me those and, and I come up with an answer uh, and we record those are three, four minute videos, not very long. Uh, also we have one asset protection for high net worth individuals that you'll find on a wiser time YouTube channel. You can also follow me on a, um, on YouTube or a Twitter at wiser investor is my handle. Thanks for listening. Thanks guys for your time. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We would also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. We would love to hear from you. This episode was produced and edited by Lil Tim Moore. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make 
make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation, and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk, and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.